are you guys doing? Good, right? Almost to the end, almost to the end. Um, so thank you for attending. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce myself real quickly. My name is Ahmed Sidki. Uh, my background, I'd come, uh, I, I started my career as a developer. And then uh, for a bunch of years, uh, did a lot of leading teams. And then decided, uh, for some odd reason, to do my master's in requirements engineering. It's a mistake. Um, and then sort of pivoted and uh, did my PhD in um, agile adoption and transformation. Um, from Virginia Tech. I co-authored a book called Becoming Agile in an Imperfect World and co-founded uh, the International Consortium for Agile. And really, a big bulk of my career has been um, training and uh, helping with large-scale transformations within uh, large corporations. And I'm currently the Director of Development Management at Riot Games um, in Los Angeles. All right, so I'm going to get right to it. And I want you guys to meet Jack. Say hi to Jack. Really, you're going to do anything I tell you. You're going to say hi to a PowerPoint. OK, this is going to get fun today. Um, so Jack is a CIO of a typical corporation. And that corporation has, let's say, 10,000 or 100,000, doesn't make a difference, uh, people. And Jack wants to transform his organization to Agile as soon as possible. Okay, but Jack has a plan, so don't worry. And here's Jack's plan. And I promise I did not copy this from anyone, so if it looks familiar, well, it is familiar. Uh, so Jack's plan looks something like this. Start, cross, uh, start training people across IT on Agile, and that means Scrum to him. Um, and then he picked uh, Stacy, who's a star in that uh, organization, and told her, uh, congratulations, Stacy. In addition to your day job, you are now in charge of the Agile transformation. Stacy cried, but it was all internal, but that's OK. Um, they launched two pilot projects. They were doing Scrum. It was very successful. So he sent out a memo to all of IT and said, by the end of the year, we're going to all be Agile. Any questions? No one asked questions, so the memo uh, went through. and. The plan is to launch five new pilot teams, uh, or five new teams every quarter. And by the way, the CIO is very committed. So he's meeting with Stacy once a month to make sure that teams are actually adopting Agile. And they um, are getting an Agile tool uh, to make sure that things are good and consistent. Any questions? Does this look familiar to anyone? Yep. Do you know Jack? <laughs> Are you Stacy? <laughs> Maybe? OK. So, so the question we're going to talk about in this session basically is, is Jack's plan sustainable? Is it organizational level? And will it really yield agility or not? Now, does anyone remember the title of this talk? Does anyone remember the title of any talks they attended today? So the title of this talk is The Secret Yet Obvious Ingredient to Achieving Sustainable Organizational Agility. So my question to you guys, I don't like to keep secrets to the end. So what is the secret? What do you guys think the secret ingredient is? What do you think? This is an interactive keynote. <laughs> what do you think the secret ingredient is? What else? Trust? Mindset. Iterations. I have a whole hour, by the way, to do this. Any other thoughts what the secret ingredient could be? Common sense, yes. Open culture. All these are great. So do you want me to tell you the secret ingredient or wait till the end? Tell you? No, no one's patient anymore. It's a culture thing. All right, so the secret ingredient basically is changing the way people think about work and their understanding of what it means to be agile. 
Any questions? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so let's think about this more. And uh, I'll tell you a lot more about this um, throughout the rest of the session. So what I want to do is also not just tell, us, tell you sort of empty PowerPoints, but I'm going to use stories from these four companies um, sort of to weave in how they're using this ingredient, how they're changing the way people think to achieve the sustainable organizational agility, and whether your story is similar to Jack's or to one of these, that's totally fine. You'll have a different story, but you'll see how all of this can mesh together and how you can uh, achieve sustainable organizational agility. Uh, the flow for today will be basically, number one, what needs to change about the way people think? So if, if I'm coming out here and saying, the secret ingredient is changing the way people think, what about it needs to actually change? The second is our understanding of agility. The third is why education is the key, or the secret ingredient. And then I'm going to pull stories from these four companies and um, give you examples. Good? You guys ready? Yes is the answer to that question. Are you guys ready? Yes. Awesome. All right, first thing, changing the way people think. So here's a common mental model on how people think about building things, just in general, right? This is, if, if we were to survey most of humanity, this is how people would think. You get an idea, right? And then you go through this phase of designing and exploring the idea more to, at the end, you know, decide on what you're going to actually produce, okay? Once you've decided on what you're going to produce, you start to plan if you need to buy stuff for it, if you need to, you know, hire people for it, then you execute it and you get it. Pretty simple mental model. No scientific research was done behind this model, right? But that's how people typically think. Now, while this is fine, there's really two different worlds of work, and it's a spectrum. This isn't anything absolute, right? But work is on this spectrum. One side of the spectrum I'd call task work, and the other side of the spectrum I'll call knowledge work. So task work is work that pretty much doesn't require a lot of human intellect or intelligence as you're executing it. And knowledge work would be the opposite, where a lot of it is dependent on thinking. Um, for example, Task work is building a building, but the design of that building, the blueprints are actually knowledge work, right? So coming up with the design of that building, you go through a lot of you know, innovation and you throw out ideas and all that kind of stuff, but once you decide on something, the actual building is more or less task work, all right? The key word here is more or less because, again, a lot of work sort of lands somewhere in the middle of that spectrum, right? but is it more towards this way or more towards that way? Um, teaching is a good form of knowledge work. I have no idea the exact words I'm going to say today, and if you tell me I don't understand, I'm not just gonna repeat the same words again, right? I have to find a different way of explaining something. Uh, writing a book, all those. Now, the mental models that come with that are also sort of interesting. Um, the mental model for task work, it's more of a linear way of working, right? So I'm going to build a building, I understand the design, I get the material, I start building it in a certain way. It's sort of like an assembly line, okay? And then knowledge work, no, it's a more of a non-linear way of thinking about work. And technically, you should have points in the middle where it's good enough, you could ship it or you keep going more, similar to how you write something. Now, Without going into too much detail here, because this is a, a we, can, we can take a much deeper dive in this, but that's not the purpose here. But there are these three aspects of how we work. Um, one is really understanding, is the outcome even knowable in advance or not? Uh, people that attended my uh, uh, session earlier, I gave the example of writing, right? And if you're, if you're writing something, it's you really don't know what the outcome is exactly, right? You don't know the exact words before you start writing. You have an idea of where you want to go. And then when you actually start writing, you learn more about what you want to say as you see the words and you read the words in front of you and so forth, okay? And for some things, the outcome is not knowable in advance. And for some things, the outcome is knowable in advance, like that 
I can do a lot of design, modeling, simulation until I figure it out, and then I go build it. The second aspect is, is our work based on tangible things, things I can actually buy and sell and go get, or is it more based on ideas and thoughts? And the third is, to the execution of the work, is it based on inspection and adaption, which is basically as you're working, you're gonna figure things out, or is it based on this coordination and control that can be done up front, right? And then there's this spectrum, right, from an assembly line mentality to a knowledge work mentality. Again, we can talk a lot more about this, but I just want you to get the gist of this spectrum. The reason this is important is when we look at um, the work of Carol Dweck in her book, Mindset, um, there's basically two, she, she identifies two types of mindset, okay? And I'll give you a quick example because again, I don't wanna dive too much into this, but I wanna give you the essence of, of what she's saying. If you ask me, Ahmed, can you sing? And I tell you, uh, actually, I have a horrible voice. I, I can't sing at all. I have just demonstrated a fixed mindset to my ability to sing. I believe that my ability to sing, so you can fill in the gap there, right, is inherently static, right? It was locked down, we're fixed, I can't sing. It was determined at birth, and I can't do anything about it, okay? Versus if you ask me, Ahmed, can you sing? And I said, well, I've never taken lessons. I'm sure if I actually try, I, I can, you know, get better at it. Do you want to help me out? That actually demonstrates that I believe that my ability to sing can be continuously developed. My true potential is unknown and unknowable. Now, why are these mindsets important? Because actually when you look at how they affect, not just how we think about singing or our personality, but how we work as well, right? They actually have a massive impact. Now, if you take a look at the, the left-hand side, this is what Carol Dweck talks about, the fixed mindset. So the fixed mindset are those who believe that certain things can't change. And the interesting thing is it leads them to a certain set of behaviors. One is avoiding to even try, okay? If I believe I can't sing, right, then I won't even try to sing. I won't put effort into it, and I'm gonna avoid any sort of failure. It, it has this inherent desire for them to look good, okay? And by the way, it's interesting. I'm giving you a, a bad example about, um, you know, I can't sing. But imagine if I actually had a nice voice. I don't. But imagine. Imagine if I had a nice voice and you asked me, okay, I may say, yes, I can sing. But I actually still could have a fixed mindset. I believe that my potential, which is high, was determined at birth. It can't change. Versus, let's say, someone else who starts at a different level but keep practicing. Who's going to get better over time? See my point? I believe I'm fixed, but I start, I'm, compared to everyone else, I have the best voice, right? But you're all in the growth mindset, and so you keep practicing and working on it, and then slowly I find myself was like, wait a minute, what just happened? Now, what happens is if you believe that you're fixed, even though you believe you're here, you're going to avoid challenging yourself to any other realm because you have an inherent desire inside of you to look good, always. Why? Because you believe you can't change it, so you have to demonstrate it. I can't develop it, so I have to demonstrate it, right? And so they stick to what they know. Do you think they like feedback? No. Why don't they like feedback? Mm-hmm. And it gets really personal, right? Because I don't believe I can change it. So you're, telling, you're giving me feedback about something I don't believe I can change, right? And I'm, I'm linking it to me. Versus a growth mindset, that have this continuous desire to learn and develop, right? They're not afraid of putting effort into learning something new. They're very okay with embracing challenges and uncertainty, and they love feedback because they believe feedback is a form of learning, and 
it's not about them, it's about their current capability, which they know they're always working on. Do you see the two mindsets? Yes, no? Do you know people with a fixed mindset? And people may have fixed mindset about stuff and a growth mindset about other stuff. So it's not like, sorry, you're fixed. <laughs> There's no hope for you. Everything, you're done, right? It, no. And, and again, you're not born with one of these mindsets. It's the conditioning that happens around you. So when I first read this book, um, Mindset by Carol Dweck, I was actually terrified because everything it was saying don't do to your kids, I was actually doing, right? I was building the best fixed mindset kids ever. And then I, I, I tweaked my language and, and, and worked on this. Now, the reason I bring this up is think about the mindset when it comes to managing uncertainty. So when we're on this side of the spectrum, so when we're in knowledge work area, let's take a look at how these mindsets respond to uncertainty. So a fixed mindset approach to managing uncertainty looks something like this. I don't want to fail, right? I don't want to look bad. I know that if you tell me what to do, I can do it. So I am going to put all the effort I have to have you fix the requirements up front. I don't care if they're called user stories, sticky notes, whatever, right? but I have an inherent desire for you to tell me what to do and please do not change your mind. Because the moment you change your mind, you're actually putting me at risk of looking bad because there's a fear of failure. The other mindset, the agile mindset, looks at managing uncertainty differently. Both want to reduce uncertainty, but one is going to reduce it by fixing it, the other is going to reduce it by learning quickly. So if you don't know, let's go and learn quickly together. Now, I'm going to show you, um, and Jeff Patton uses this picture a lot, but I'm going to take it in a different context, which is how to manage uncertainty, and sorry, how these mindsets actually have an impact on such a basic agile practice like iterations. So if we look at iterations, basic agile practice, Here's how a fixed mindset team could look at iterations. They say, hey, tell me what you want to build, and I'm going to build it in iterations, which is the top row. But look at what that is. Their intention as they build is not to learn and discover. It's to validate what you told them. So I'm going to build the first iteration, show it to you, and say, hey, is this what you want? Right? But the way they pick how to build things is not based on let's maximize learning and discovery. Look at the bottom row. Can you see it? That first picture, is it, that's designed to maximize learning and discovery. Now, I want you to notice something. Let's look at the bottom row for a second. So the bottom row started with a state of more ambiguity, which said, I want a woman sitting in a pastoral position, right? And I said, wait, let me check. Is this what you want? And the client said what, yes or no? What do you guys think? They said no. They actually said, that's horrible. Would you and your management consider that first iteration a success or a failure? Yeah, sure, we're not at an Agile conference. It has to, the right answer is success. But in reality, I have seen so many teams that will look at that and say, product owner, analyst, project manager, team. Guys, we got to get it right the next time. All right? this, is, this is a wasted iteration. So they don't look at it as learning. They actually look at it as failure. Right? And they look at it as like, now we look bad in front of our client. True or false? So when we look at this mindset aspect, this, these are, this is a basic agile practice. Yet the mindset can have a huge impact on how it's executed. And I have seen most teams execute iterations 
as the top row, not the bottom row. Would you guys agree? So, and the big difference, again, between the two is, do you want to help? Are you coming from a mindset of learning and discovery? Are you coming from a mindset of delivering and finishing? Okay. Now, when we look at the Agile Manifesto, I just want to paint it in a slightly different light than maybe what you've commonly seen it as. I call the Agile Manifesto an answer to this. How to manage uncertainty using a learning and discovery mindset in the software domain. So when we read the items of the manifesto, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, the question is, which of these two sides will actually help you learn and discover quicker? Talking to people or using processes and tools? Which of these two sides will actually help you learn quicker? Working software or comprehensive documentation? Which of the two sides will help you learn and discover quicker, right? It's that growth agile mindset in the software domain. Is this making sense? So the way I like to define agile is that agile is a mindset. I hope I've substantiated that to this point. This mindset can be applied to many different disciplines. So far, we've really cracked it on the software discipline or the software domain. But what does it look like in marketing? What are the values and principles to help learn and discover quicker in marketing, in operations, in finance, in education? That's the next one I'm interested in, right? Education, how do you actually help kids learn and discover quicker instead of more of an assembly line manner? But that's a dinner topic we can talk about. Um, so this agile mindset in the software industry is established through the set of four values we know as the manifesto, grounded by 12 principles, manifested through an unlimited number of practices. All these methodologies we talk about are basically a bundle of these practices together, and that agile is really the mindset, values, and principles. And the big question is, are you doing agile or being agile? Are you approaching Agile from a practices standpoint, similar to how an assembly line mentality person would say, hey, tell me what I need to do to be Agile. Do you see it? I've got that question so many times, it makes me sad. People, after a like, big presentation of this, so what do I need to do? Can you please give me the checklist? Because that's gonna reduce my uncertainty. <laughs> Okay, versus saying, all right, let me understand the mindset, the values, the principles, and create something that works for me, right? And being agile is being able to navigate unknown constraints to help you deliver value at the end. I created this picture because I really wanted to help people visualize the difference between being agile and doing agile. So I took a typical two-week iteration, put the typical scrum sort of ceremonies on it, so you have your iteration plan, your daily stand-ups, your release plan, right, retrospective. And I want to actually help you see this. Like the doing agile is this much. The being agile is all the other empty space. So when we talk about changing the way people think, we are not talking only about the doing. Because after this daily stand-up, what changes in the way a person works on a day-to-day -day basis? In the way they approach every little piece of work they do? That's what we're talking about here. That's the being agile part. Is this making sense now? Okay. And to do that, we really need to understand that this is not a journey to be taken by the developers, right? or the uh, scrum masters, but it's a journey to be taken by the organization because in that being agile, everyone is working, right? It's not just, let me change your behavior during the 15 minute stand up at the beginning of the day and then we're done. And then please go back to your old way of working. That was great. No, it's not that. So let's go back to Jack for a second. Question, is, Jack, is Jack's plan Helping people do Agile or be Agile? 
do. This is very much a do kind of plan. Now, here's my definition of organizational agility. Organizational agility is a culture. Similar to how agile is not a process but a mindset, organizational agility is not a process at scale, it's a mindset at scale. It's a culture. This culture is based on the values of principles of agile, supported by an organizational ecosystem, which I'll explain in a second, and then manifested through personal and organizational habits. It's how people work, not how they fake to work. Not the temporary process that, God help us, will go away in six months. Right? It's not that. It's not you procure a tool. I have heard this many times. People said, by the way, I just bought, fill in the blanks, Jira, Rally, version one, you know, Target, whatever it is. I am now agile. I was like, OK. Keep telling yourself that. <laughs> right? So this is my definition of what organizational agility is. Now, when we understand this, it's really a culture transformation, not a process transformation. I'm going to hide this slide for a second, so don't think the, the presentation went bad. Right? But who here in the room has been part of a transformation before, an IT transformation in your career, pre-agile? Right? So when we say this term, I have been part of a transformation, or we're having a transformation, or we're going through a transformation, I have seen it most of the time be on the left-hand side. We're rolling out a new ERP. We're rolling out a new workflow. We're rolling out something big and hairy and gnarly. And so we need to fo focus on process technology, new structures. It's about training, cascading decisions. It's about a good communication plan. And at the end of the day, there is a notion of compliance. Right? Are you on this new thing that we just decreed that every one of you will be on? Now, when we talk about a culture transformation, it's actually very different. It's about the focus needs to be about people and culture. The difference between training and education is massive. Right? I went through four years of college to learn essentially how to program, computer science, right? I can take people through a five-day course, and they will learn how to program. What is the difference? Did I waste four years of my life? Don't say yes, please. <laughs> I'm assuming I didn't. The difference is one of us, hopefully the person that went to the four years, right? was educated, learned the underlying values, concepts, principles behind things. And then they learned the tools. And by the way, day one on the job, both people may be equal. But one has a potential to accelerate much more than the other. It's about creating a shared vision. It's about commitment to a new way of working. I can't go around as like, OK, guys, we're going to do a quick audit on the Agile mindset today. So please, everyone, open your mind. Let me check your mindset. Right? It doesn't work like that. Right? It really is a shared commitment with the organization. So again, keep in mind where in this spectrum your organization is, is on. Now, I talked about this organizational ecosystem a few minutes ago. This is how I like to view culture. Does anyone? And I know this is a really weird request. Does anyone have a rubber band on them right now? A rubber band? Yeah. I actually can't see a thing with the lights. Oh, thank you. So if you can see this, here's how I like to view culture. Culture is this rubber band, right, that is formed by the elements inside of it. Leadership their style, their values, their beliefs, right? The strategy, how do we set goals? How do we reward? How do we measure, right? How do we make decisions? The structure, how are roles and responsibilities defined, right? How are organizations structured, siloed or overlapping or whatnot? Our processes, when we look at the value chain end to end, how do business processes work? And then people, what are the fundamental beliefs of people, right? Do they believe in collaboration or competition? 
Do they believe it? And all these, all these form the culture of the organization. So it's shaped by the elements inside, but at the same time, that membrane, that rubber band, that bungee cord, also keeps the elements inside in sync. So it's formed by the elements inside, yet it itself has a power to keep things aligned. Now, let me demonstrate to you what I think most organizations are doing with their transformation. They take this wedge called process and they push it real hard. Push it. What do you think happens when that sponsor removes, is removed, or gets removed, or changes, or the coaches leave the organization, whatever it is? What do you think happens? Right back. I don't call that a transformation. I call that temporary pain. And for the rest of the organization that don't believe in what we believe in, it is temporary pain that, thank God, went away. Take your Agile and leave, right? Because it wasn't a transformation. It was actually a misalignment of culture. Your collaborative work approach was in total misalignment with everyone else. The business people didn't care about collaboration, really. They cared about competition, right? Developers really could care. Like, all these things, and I'm not saying this is you know, everywhere, but I'm saying you have to be very aware of this. Actually, I'm going to hang on to it for, yeah, mind me. Um, so when we look back at this triangle, okay, successful transformations, from my point of view and from my experience, move the entire triangle. Because that alignment of culture is actually really important. In the book, Good to Great, they were talking about one of the key successes of high-performing organizations is an alignment of culture. And it's, it's, it doesn't matter what they're aligned on. They could all be aligned on command and control, but as long as they're aligned, right? But it's not about an inconsistency. It's not about, let's have a really collaborative process and a non-collaborative structure. Any form of resistance in your organization a lot of people come up to me with this question. The business people are fill in the blanks. The IT people are fill in the blanks. Leadership sucks, right? Any form of resistance, I want you to look at it as like, what's pulling in a direction that other things aren't pulling in? There's a misalignment of direction. So from my point of view, you have to move these elements together. You have to perform a common journey for these elements to move. Now. We got to break them down because there's two distinct categories for these elements, human elements and non-human elements. Strategy, structure, and process are non-human elements. Leadership and people are human elements. Question, where is the industry focused, human or non-human? The first line in the manifesto says, Hmm, me confused. You have to do both. But in my opinion, which will give you sustainable agility? You don't change the way people think. You put the most agile structures, strategies, and process in place. There is a desire to break them. <laughs> There's a desire, because you haven't changed the way people think. Or, like worst case scenario, misuse them. Like I showed you with iterations. Sure, I'd love the idea of iterations, but I'm going to use it with my fixed mindset. I love the idea of stand-ups. That's a great status report. Right? What did you do yesterday? What did you do yesterday? Do you yes, right? We're misusing these because we really haven't changed this, the top part. Now, how do you change the top part? And by the way, that's where I want to focus today. Because I think there's a lot of great efforts being done on the non-human elements, right? A lot of new scaling frameworks coming out. True? Great, safe, less, dad, right? Actually, that's cool, safe, less, dad. But anyway. Um, 
or dad is safeless? Maybe, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not making fun of it, but I'm saying those are focused here on strategy, structure, and process. By the way, which are essential elements in a transformation. But what are we doing on our human elements? We're telling them, let's do it. <laughs> There's a lot of paradigm shifts that need to happen. And that happens through learning, through deep learning and introspection and reflection. There's coaching. And I'm talking about professional coaching where people come to their own self-realizations. And then there's mentoring, which is applied application and advice of, let me show you how to do this, right? That's how you start to transform the human elements. Now, let me ask you something. Which is easier to track the progress of? Non-human. Which is more tangible? Which is more, and then go all back to our behaviors and as, as an assembly line worker, this has a checklist, <laughs> right? So the reason we're attracted to the non-human is because we ourselves haven't changed our mindset about the transformation. We are still going up to people and say, can you give me a plan for this transformation? Let's give me a step-by-step -step process to change my culture, and quickly. So the key question was, so what do people need to learn? What do people need to learn? I taught them Scrum. What else do they need to learn? All right, I'll give you another workshop on user stories. What else do you want from me? Estimation, sure, let's do another one on estimation, all right? But what else? And that was the question we really were trying to answer with the International Consortium for Agile. So I wanna, I wanna introduce you to the work that's being done by IC Agile in this regard. Take it, use it, don't use it, totally up to you, right? And the reason I'm focusing on that because I think you guys all know the work that's happening on the non-human elements, but I wanna show you a little bit of the work that's happening over there, and hopefully this could be of benefit to you. So again, what IC Agile does IC Agile is an accreditation and certification body. They don't train. But what they do is they gather experts from around the world to actually sit down and define what people need to learn. And I'll show you that in a second. Then they accredit the learning. They want to ensure that, okay, great, we have this great set of people need to learn these things, but how do we ensure people are learning it? It's through accreditation. And then when you see some of these learning tracks, they are long. This is not a two-day class, all right? And so you want to motivate people to pursue a journey. And what we have found is, sure, for good or for bad, for what it's worth, certifications are a way for people to be recognized as pursuing a journey. So, and I'll talk more about that. And I'm going to talk again. I, I haven't forgot our four stories. We'll bring them into the mix as we talk. Actually, I'm gonna talk first about Salesforce. So let's walk you through, does everyone know who Salesforce is? All right, so Salesforce is a pioneer in cloud computing, CRM, and it has expanded to take over a lot of that space. It's the number one um, CRM tool, and they now have a marketing platform and a support platform. And Really, um, I think they were rated this year and probably consistently across several other years, uh, one of the best places to work for um, in the US. Now, Salesforce had an interesting challenge. Salesforce has their own agile methodology called adaptive delivery methodology, okay? Now, if you have your own methodology and that's what you wanna teach, and I think that's great that they have their own methodology, why? because they've customized it to what works for them, okay? So you wanna teach it to all your employees. Here's the challenge, what are, you, what are you going to do? You can't bring in external trainers, they don't know the methodology. You can't bring in some of the external certifications, and did certifications matter for them? Actually, yes. There are people, right, people at Salesforce said, if we're gonna sit in a two-day class, give me something, right? 
give me something to show, like when I leave, that you know, I, there's some professional development in this. And so they said, okay, we have an issue. We can't bring in like you know Scrum training or or this or that training. So what we're going to do is we're going to build our own certification. And Salesforce has a very successful certification in the cloud and Salesforce space. So they said, hey, we have an experience doing that. So we're going to build our own Agile certification. Make sense? Why not? It's an in-house methodology. We can't bring anyone else to train on it, so we're going to build our own internal certification. Do you think people like that? Do you think the Salesforce employees like that? Why not? Yeah, great idea doesn't achieve the purpose. Right? Because the moment I leave Salesforce, no one knows what the certification is. And by the way, I've seen many corporations resort to creating their own certification program because nothing out there matches what they need. Now, that's where they that's when we met, IC Agile and Salesforce. And IC Agile focuses on Agile values, principles, mindsets, so, and it defines them through a set of learning objectives. So when we showed them that, listen, we have these eight learning tracks. Now, here's, here's an important point. If you're trying to build a, a methodology-less education program, what are you going to base it on? Like, if you look at the Scrum Alliance program, it's based on roles. You have certified Scrum Master, certified, you know, a product owner, certified developer, right? It's based on the roles of that methodology. But if we're not focusing on a methodology, what do you base the learning on? And so we decided to base it on a set of disciplines. These are disciplines and crafts that are needed within teams. So you need coaching, you need development, you need testing, you need leadership, you need management, you need value management, you need enterprise level coaching, right? You need these disciplines. And then there's more disciplines coming out, by the way, right? But each of these disciplines is defined through a set of learning objectives. Now, here's something really important. Why would Salesforce look at someone else's learning objectives and give them any weight? It's because who developed the learning objectives? So what IC Agile has done is it has gathered experts from around the world, thought leaders and, and real deep practitioners, to develop learning objectives. It takes around two to three years to develop the set of learning objectives for one of these tracks. All right? And so when you look at some of these names, some of these names are, are well known in the industry, and these are the people that have contributed to the creation of these learning objectives. So if you want to look at it, it's sort of like when they created the Agile Manifesto and didn't focus on a methodology. It was, it's a continuation of not focusing on a methodology and deepening crafts, right? So each track that you've seen, like each one of these tracks has a set of learning objectives. And by the way, these are available for free to download. Like this isn't... Now you have to purchase each of these tracks for, no, just go and learn about what these disciplines are, right? And you can see here, like, this is one track. You're talking about, like, 25 pages of learning objectives. Each one of these is defined, like, here's the purpose of this learning objective. Make sure you cover these topics. Like, it's, it's a great amount of detail, and it's all methodology agnostic. So you won't, you won't find terms like, you know, you have to do a two-week sprint, right, or a four-week sprint. You'll find time box iterations or any other form of limiting work in progress, right? So you can teach this using Kanban, using Scrum, using whatever methodology, but remember, all these methodologies, the purpose is to learn and be agile, okay? So what Salesforce liked was the fact that they could actually accredit their material against a set of generic learning objectives, not breaking their idea of a methodology. The other thing, going back to the Salesforce, was a really big challenge in how to scale. How do they scale their training? They're a massive organization with hundreds of teams. So if they brought in certain vendors, then how can they actually scale that? And so, and, and again, I, I quote, 
one of the reasons they, they used um, IC Agile for this is because it was actually much more scalable than having in-house CSTs or in-house um, other kind of trainers. Now, basically through these stories, I'm introducing you to the work of IC Agile, but instead of showing it to you, we're gonna talk about more stories. Now, this story by Agile X may be relevant for most of you, or for some of you in the audience. Agile X is a services company. It is actually one of the leading providers of Agile services to the US government and was recently acquired by Accenture, okay? Now, they have a really good Agile practice, but here's their journey and how it looked like. Basically, as they were working with clients, their coaches and their team members came back to them and said, hey, we need more knowledge on estimation. So the people at AgileX created a workshop on Agile estimation and gave it to them. Hey, we need more knowledge about user stories. All right, let me, let me create something. So this was this pull demand sort of manner of we, we have these gaps in our knowledge, help us, right? And it was all based on circumstantial situations. Now, the other challenge is so why didn't they just send them to a training course? They couldn't take them off billable hours with their client for two to three days, right? So this bite-size information giving actually worked perfectly for them. The challenge they had was inconsistency. So the teams that asked about estimation knew how to estimate. The teams that didn't were doing their own thing, right? And there was big holes and gaps in knowledge. Now, again, remember how we're framing this. We're framing this in the light of education and learning. So what is the curriculum for them? Well, this is where, again, they, they, they looked at what IC Agile has to offer, and they looked at a set of learning objectives, and they said, well, wait a minute. So we can actually use this as guidance on how to design courses? It's like, yes. So by the way, these are a set of learning objectives from one of the tracks. Again, each one of these has a whole you know, paragraph of text behind it. But the point is, they could actually use this as guidance on design. So they sat down their people and said, wait, as we give small modules to people, make sure we're covering these topics, okay? But then they said, wait a minute. Do we have to teach them all together, or can we separate them? We said at IC Agile, all we focus on is learning experiences, not courses. So they said, great. So what they're actually doing today is they've broken down right, their learning experience into 15 modules. Some modules are via video. Some modules are live. right? And they have a, I think it's a three or four month program where people start. They get these modules at a rate that doesn't break their work, okay? And then by the end of it, and by the way, the, 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 by, so, so this is how the accreditation is done. And what we do at IC Agile is we, we have a four-hour session with them actually walking through the material and making sure it's covered. So what this does to the students is it's a guarantee that, yes, this material that I'm taking is actually covering the learning objective. Some other entity has validated that. But the powerful thing for the student was tracking learning. So they could actually get a transcript and see, these are the topics I need to finish, and these are the things I finished so far, and these are the things I haven't finished. And that could give Agile X and others a really good progress status on what modules they finished, what they didn't finish, and what learning still needed to happen. And when people finished all the learning, they got the certification or the base level certification. And they could actually track modular learning as well through even community of practice events. So they took the learning objectives and they sort of spread it out in a variety of different learning experiences. So again, um, some examples. Let's move on to our third story, just because of time. And I know we have some Intuit people in the audience, so if I'm saying anything wrong, you can correct me. Anyone know who Intuit is? At least one person in the audience should know, right? Okay. So 
Intuit um, builds accounting and financial software, QuickBooks, TurboTax, um, and again, one of the, uh, I think in India, they're the eighth best place to work for, and I know in the US they're like top 30 or something like that. Um, Intuit's story was, again, different. Intuit had a journey, like many organizations, Agile started organically. So, meaning a team had an Agile need, they went and hired a vendor. So one team hired you know, Scrum.org, the other team hired Lean Kanban instructors, the third team hired CST, the fourth team didn't hire anyone and opened books and learned, right? And so they had many different ways of, of doing Agile, which actually they liked, okay? But the challenge was inconsistency of results and lack of common terminology between the people doing Agile. Now, a couple of years back, they shifted to a central model where there was an actual team responsible for delivery across, uh, of Agile adoption across Intuit, um, globally. And so that organization actually had a very clear goal of delivering world-class agility through enterprise-wide adoption of Agile principles. And so what they did was they actually built their own training program that focused on agile principles and a common set of terminology and values. And they started training this across 600 people initially. And it was very successful. The level of demand they had for this was, as, as uh, Ian was telling me, like beyond their capacity. Why? because it actually gave people the gaps they needed and the common terminology that they could work with across teams. Now, the big challenge they had was, what's next? What do we actually offer people next? We've, we've done a great job aligning people on the fundamentals and filling in those gaps, but what is the next part of the journey? I can't just give them fundamentals and stop. And so, that's where they started actually looking into what does an Agile curriculum look like, okay? And again, that's where we met with them, right? As I see Agile, and they looked at this and they said, actually, this is the exact sort of curriculum we're looking for. So we can, and by the way, it was discipline-based, it was value-based, so we can take people that are doing coaching through a coaching track, we can take people doing development through a development track, and so forth. But they had a real issue that they had 600 people they already trained. What are we gonna do with them? Now we're starting a new sort of quote unquote certification program, but I have already invested in 600 people. I'm not gonna reteach them that, and that was totally fine. Remember, all the work done is based on did you achieve learning objectives or not? So we took a look at the 600 people that trained on their initial course, what learning objectives they actually had finished, and the learning objectives they hadn't finished, they created a little small delta course for them that filled in those gaps and got them with the rest of the people on the journey, okay? Now, the key thing for them was their global operations. They had a big challenge with that because we like flexibility, but we want consistency as well. How can we achieve both? And by the way, this is a problem I've seen with many corporations. Like, we don't want one flavor of Agile, but we want a certain level of consistency across our teams so that there's common expectations. So what do we do? And we have people in India, we have people in the US, all over the US, what are we going to do? We can't scale that much. So what IC Agile also gave them was a language to talk to vendors with, right? So they have their own internal in-house fundamentals course, but when it came to all of these specialty courses, they could actually talk to a provider in India and say, listen, we want you to design an agile project management course for us, make sure it covers these learning objectives. And then a different provider back in the US and say, hey, listen, design this course and make sure it covers the IC Agile learning objectives. So you can actually have customized courses for different whether it's global um, reasons or, or even variety reasons, but at the same time, there's a certain level of consistency um, across that because all of them are sort of built around the same learning objectives. 
I'll end with this story, Riot Games. Now, Riot Games may be, again, similar to some of you, they don't care about certification. They actually purely care about competency building. So they have 60 internal agile coaches. By the way, anyone heard of Riot Games? All right, I didn't think so. Their target audience is much younger than the people in this room. Um, they have the largest played game in the world, 90 million active players. Um, and uh, the, the game is called League of Legends. Uh, now you've heard of it, yes, okay. So the target audience is still younger than the people in this room. Uh, but I, I, I play it every once in a while uh, with my family as well. The, the point is, they, as a gaming company, they could care less about certifications. And many corporations, they don't care about certifications. But what they care about is competency building. We want to have the best developers. We want to have the best coaches. We want to have the best testers. And so their relationship with IC Agile was for a different reason. When you look at the IC Agile learning roadmap, what their target was is, are these gold level certifications. These are what are called expert level certifications. And those are competency based. Let me explain what competency based means. It means, let's take this coaching route, right? It means for someone to become a coach, they actually need to learn about the fundamentals of Agile, they then need to learn about agile coaching, agile facilitation, and then they need to demonstrate competency. Let me go back just so that you're, you're following me. It, we're talking about this track. So they take this knowledge-based certification, this one, this one, and then they can apply for this competency-based certification. Now, the big question we had is how do you assess competency? How do you actually do that? Here's what we've developed. We've developed a competency matrix, right, that took the same learning objectives from a competency-based perspective and said, guess what? Here's what a beginner coach will demonstrate. Here's what a developing coach will demonstrate, what a competent coach and what a proficient coach will demonstrate. And they give this rubric to, let's say you're applying for the expert certification, IC Agile will give it to you and to the assessors. Who's the assessors? Three other Agile experts that graduated before you. Now, the key is we call show, don't tell. We understand that people can talk about their work all day long. As a coach, I do this and this and this and this. Like, show, don't tell. So they actually have to submit videos of themselves facilitating Agile teams, right? They submit references of teams that they've worked with in IC Agile context them. And then live on this video um, panel, they actually have to do professional coaching, 15 minutes of professional coaching, 15 minutes of mentoring. So the whole point, and for the testing track, they actually have to create a test plan and talk about, in this case study, which things will be automated. So it's not a matter of filling out a, a questionnaire or answering an exam but it's really competency-based demonstration. Now, why did this appeal to Riot Games? Because what they gave their coaches was this. They gave them a goal. They said, we want you, by the end of the year, we'll give you a year, to get the expert certification. That's it. They created a pull system for mentoring. The biggest challenge they had was they couldn't mentor all the people there, because like, what would the mentoring program look like? And they believed in a concept of, well, if I'm the director or whatnot, like, tell me what you need to grow. I'm not gonna keep knocking on your door and telling you, uh, would you like to learn this today? Would you like to learn this today, right? So what they created was a pull system by giving people an objective that was far out and saying, you got a year to do it. And so they actually, it was all self-propelled that they found the training for facilitation, they found the training for coaching, and then based on this rubric, they could read and say, well, wow, I'm, I'm really not there yet, I'm here, right? And I need to get to that competent level. So to pass the IC Agile certification, you have to be competent in all these areas. You have to demonstrate competency. 
And so they would actually go back to their mentors and say, I really don't know how to get from here to here. Can you show that? And that became a very different discussion than a push mentoring system. It's like, let me teach you something new today versus they are coming to them and saying, how do I, how do I actually teach someone something that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense? So anyway, to, uh, to wrap up, I'll, and also sort of tell you a, a, a bonus story, um, this is very dear to me to see universities start to adopt the IC Agile model. And the University of Miami, um, Miami University in, in the US, is the one I want to highlight because it's a public university, right? It's a public university. And they've integrated the learning objectives of the IC Agile fundamentals into their core curriculum. Meaning people graduating from computer science will actually have that base understanding of how to work as a knowledge worker. And really for me, that's the future hope that, you know, in five years, none of us would be learning about the fundamentals, right? Students graduating would already have this, and then depending on their craft and discipline, they'll be learning what they need to learn. So to summarize, there's human elements, non-human elements, right? I believe that the human elements will generate that sustainable organizational agility. I think the coaching and mentoring is understood, but again, I like it to happen from a pull system, hence the Riot game story. And the key thing here is the learning. We're not investing that much in learning. We're investing in basic training for people versus actual deep, deep paradigm shift kind of learning. And that's what I think IC Agile um, presents. So, Secret ingredient, I hope we've, came, we've come sort of full circle, changing the way people think about work and their understanding of what it means to be agile. And with that, I'll uh, open the floor for, we have two minutes of questions. I know I'm over time, but they actually told me I get to 610 because we started late. No questions? Any questions? One question. Yeah, a uh, question that I have is, uh, this has uh, been a very interesting talk, you know, personally for me. I uh, learned, learned a lot of new things in this uh, presentation, so thanks for that. You're welcome. So the question I have is, uh, with all these objectives, how do you really measure the, the success of this initiative with the different companies that, you know, have actually adopted these learning objectives? So uh, the question is, how do you measure the the and, and this is why we've actually separated two types of certification. One is the silver ones. We call those knowledge-based certification. And basically what that is is you've acquired the knowledge. So what? Right? The goal has always been the competency-based certification. So that's really where the goal is. That's where you want to assess. You want people to become experts. Right? I don't want people, I mean, why are we even teaching one or two day courses, right? It's for people to develop competency. That's ultimately the goal. And that's ultimately what we want to assess. So the assessment is really built into this layer. And the whole purpose of this is a journey. We want to actually stop having people just take one course and stop. Because that's, that's the behavior we've seen. And that doesn't deepen people's agile knowledge in a certain discipline. So they take a course, they take an exam, they get something, it's like, yay, I'm done. It's like, wait, where are you on this journey? And have you achieved a level of competency that can actually be demonstrated to your peers? One last question. Todd? I think a, a mic is coming. mindset and the certification. And I was curious as to, or at least particular, seemed like my observation is um, a lot of the market drive for certification may be coming from people of a fixed mindset. Can you, uh, a lot of the? The, the market drive for certification is coming from people of a fixed mindset. That's a really good point. So, and, and I, I haven't done that, like, research or dug deep into that. Todd's point is, well, 
couldn't all this need for certification basically be coming as a, uh, from people of a fixed mindset, right? And so this is sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy because they want to look good. I think, I think that may be the case with some people, and I don't think we're going to change that, right? Because that's, that's where their, their mindset is. And our hope is through this learning journey, right, they'll actually deepen a, a set of understandings that it's not about that, right? It, it's actually about something different. But there are other people that I have personally met that I believe have a very growth mindset, and they're looking for tokens of recognition or appreciation along the way. It doesn't, that's not their focus, let's put it that way, right? But it's a nice to have. And when it comes to two things that are nice to have, like, you know, if, if it's, if it's no extra effort, I'll take it, but it's not what they seek. So the example I gave you about Riot Games, they could care less about the certification itself, but what they were actually seeking is the journey of knowledge, right? And so they saw value, those people saw value in that, in that expert level where it was peer-based, right? And a recognition of like, yes, I have demonstrated that competency, and it's a token of, of that achievement. But I think you may be right, yeah. Go ahead, follow up. And then what is the place for those people that have fixed mindsets? <sighs> I think there's, uh, and, and, and it's interesting because I think a lot of people even go, even with growth mindsets, they go back sometimes to the fixed mind. It's a, it's a constant struggle. And I think it's a continuous level of awareness and education. And if, if we're trying to, say that some people will have a fixed mindset and never change that. I think that's a fixed mindset from our perspective. I think it's, it's, a, it's a stance to help them see a different mindset. I mean, in the book, Carol Dweck highlights, and I'll, I'll end with this, how to change people's mindset, right? That was the last chapter. And the first thing is actually educating people that there is a different mindset, and I believe through educational journeys like this or others, right? I, could, I really doesn't matter, but having people understand that there are different mindsets, and then it's situational. With every thing that happens, you may be sort of defaulting to a fixed mindset. It's reminding you that there is a alternative way of looking at it and those reinforcement mechanisms. So even, even if you look at this journey, Todd, it's based on a mentoring platform, right? So you actually help people get through um, to that. And anyway, with that, uh, I got the uh, Nuresh uh, symbol of shut up because we're done. Thank you, guys. <laughs>